The Africa CDC weekly media briefing on uh, COVID-19 response in Africa is underway virtually on Zoom. It's led by Africa CDC Director Dr. John Ngenga Song. Let's take it there live. In terms of uh, uh, vaccine delivery, uh, you heard the numbers and uh, more vaccines are coming into the AVAT system and more vaccines are also coming into the COVAX and bilateral donations. So I think that is very encouraging. We now have to prepare ourselves for vaccination. I think that is what, um, what you are referring to. And if you recall, just uh, on Monday, we had a, a high level meeting of all ministers of health and all partners on the, uh, uh, the continent, all partners, not just partners in Africa, but they included UNICEF, WHO, uh, Gavi, COVAX, we all brought them together under the umbrella of African Union and Africa CDC to discuss strategies to um, increase vaccination, to discuss our coordination efforts, to discuss partnerships that are required to increase our levels of vaccination. Remember, our target is to get to 70% of uh, vaccination by the end of next year. So uh, we are 10%, we are a long way to go, but at least uh, we are making a, a progress. You are right, we need a massive campaign a massive campaign at every country level so that everyone should go out there, especially with what we now know with the variant coming. Uh, you cannot even talk of a booster if people have not received their first doses of vaccine. So I think our campaign should be aiming at pushing out people that have not received their first dose to receive the first dose, push out people that have received their first dose to get the second dose, and then those uh, eligible population uh, to get their uh, their third uh, their third booster dose eligible population meaning starting with people that have received that are, are uh, the elderly and those who have uh, a, a immunocompromised uh, status there. So I think that continues to remain the order of business. For, and it's a collective action that we should really encourage all of uh, everyone. There's about twenty percent of people out there that are really hesitant. Okay, uh, studies upon studies are showing that. The level of acceptance of vaccine range on the continent between 78 to 82 percent. So, but there's 20 percent out there that we need, really need to work very, very hard to bring them out. The second thing you discuss about the travel restriction, we are very encouraged to see that uh, countries, uh, uh, some countries, are beginning to lift uh, up their travel restrictions. I think that is very. We uh, continue to uh, uh, believe that. We can only address the, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic, regardless of the variant. Because again, I just want to make an emphasis here that the variants are not new viruses. They're the same viruses. They are just, uh, I'll call it genotypes of the same virus. That we continue to express work in solidarity, in cooperation uh, with the spirit, especially the spirit at which South Africa has shown us the way that we, we sh must share information and share that in a timely fashion. But again, the spirit of global solidarity and global cooperation must prevail so that we combat this virus uh, 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 collectively. Thank you very much, uh, John. We go over now to James uh, Chege. And uh, James begins with a preamble, which I will give to you, and then go into his two questions. So the facts that he presents, firstly, he says, the risk of needing to stay in hospital for patients with the Omicron variant of COVID-19 is 40 to 45% lower than for patients with the Delta variant, according to research by London's Imperial College. Then he says in Scotland, the Omicron variant of the coronavirus appears less likely to result in COVID-19 hospitalization than Delta, according to an analysis of early data. And the third point that he mentions is that, and this is all happening while a South African study suggests reduced risks of hospitalization and severe disease in people infected with the Omicron coronavirus variant versus the Delta. Then James goes on to ask his two questions. The first one, how do they inform our understanding of the new variant? The second question, we know that the UK has a high vaccination rate and that South Africa has high young population with natural immunity. What about the rest of Africa and the world? So those are two questions from James Chege. 
No, very, very good question. I think there is um, that that is what I said earlier, James. That we should uh, interpret the data in South Africa with a lot of uh, 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 caution. Put that in the context of this is early days, and uh, public health practice is local, which means that you have to look at the population, the pathogen, and then of course look at uh, the, the, um, the 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 the, the, the the outcomes in, in, and put them in that context. And which you just said, I mean, in South Africa, we are seeing based on the results that our colleagues are reporting there, about 70 to 80% less severity. And in the UK, you're seeing about 40% less severity there, so, or hospitalization. So that speaks also to the fact that the population may actually be playing a role that South Africa given the, the median population, that age of the population, that is probably about 20 years old, is helping, uh, is contributing many uh, to that situation we are seeing. I think that, is, again, these are early days. Again, I don't want to extrapolate that. We don't want to leave this uh, press conference by extrapolating massively the, the findings in South Africa across the continent. The, the Omicron is still being detected in uh, across African countries, and I, I shared the numbers with you. And uh, uh, we will continue to learn as uh, the virus spread, and especially in terms of in terms of hospitalization, and also in terms of um, the deaths that results from it. But very importantly, also in terms of vaccination, those who have been vaccinated, how many people are getting breakthrough with the Omicron uh, virus? So I think that is the what we are uh, dealing with now and trying to understand. I'm looking at your two questions: what do, we, how does that help our understanding? I hope I address that. And then the population effect. Clearly, we cannot dismiss that. But again, early days, data mainly coming from South Africa, we we'll need to see what happens across the continent as the Omicron spreads. All right. Thank you very much. Good morning to Sarah Jerving, who is with DevEx. Sarah, please go ahead with your question. Thank you so much. Um, with all of the new agreements and MOUs around COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing on the African continent, uh, do you think this production will have a significant impact on supply for African nations next year? And can you um, can you describe what kind of impact that would be? Um, and then secondly, from what I understand, Avat is 9 million doses short of its end of year goal. Uh, is that correct? And why why is that? Thank you. So uh, I believe, uh, Sarah, that um, by the, the by the end of next year, we'll begin to see a change in the the levels of um, the availability of vaccines on the continent. Not just for vaccines that are produced on the continent, but also the overall supply uh, 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 supply chain for vaccines on the continent. But very importantly, we are hoping that uh, to see increase supplies from the Johnson & Johnson, uh, uh, from the Aspen uh, manufacturing in South Africa. We expect to see uh, production sites in, in Senegal uh, go live by the end of next year. And, uh, and Egypt, and Egypt, we already heard during the meeting in Kigali that they are producing now about 3.5 million doses of vaccines. Uh, that is the fill and finish for the Chinese vaccine. So. I expect to see that that situation will change by by, by the end of end of next year. So, uh, in terms of the uh, the Avat supplies, I that is not my understanding. My and we can certainly check that. I mean, but my understanding from our briefing is that I think the, the supplies that we are receiving from Avat are on course. I think we don't, uh, we've not heard of any delays uh, for that. But again, I can. <clears throat> definitely check with Mr. Masiwa, whose uh, 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 role is to ensure and coordinate those deliveries and, and get back to you, hopefully, after the new year. But we have not heard anything that is concerning from the Johnson & Johnson supplies. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we don't have any open questions for now, but uh, perhaps we need to give colleagues a few minutes to uh, put through their questions. In the meantime, let me just give out that WhatsApp number again. It is uh, plus 251-904-139935. But we also take your questions live and uh, through the question and answer section. So while we are waiting for more questions to come in, let me just uh, pose one. And it is in terms of the restrictions that we saw across the world. 
how now that countries are starting to open up again and allowing people to move, what possible reasons are emerging for having uh, put down such restrictions, especially without any medical evidence to show that uh, Omicron would be worse than Delta? What would have been the explanation behind that? So the explanation behind that, uh, Wayne, is that we, we look at the mutations that were reported on the Omicron virus. They, they had all the, the, what are called the dangerous mutations that Delta had, okay? And then in addition to that, many more uh, mutations, in the total of more than 32 different mutations. And that suggested, and those mutations suggested, the key word here is very early on, suggested increased trans transmissibility, increased ability to escape uh, the immune system, and increased ability to escape from vaccines from people that have been vaccinated. So I think a combination of that um, created an atmosphere where people, where countries were very, very concerned that uh, we, as to what would happen. And the reason countries gave in uh, uh, restricting movement was to understand more what the virus was like and to put in place uh, appropriate measures. I think the overall um, our position has been that we should really work collectively uh, to have a common approach on how we're dealing with variants because it is absolutely uh, possible that other variants will emerge similar to the Omicron and uh, we should have a, a, a consistency in patterns of how behavior as to how we deal with such uh, emergence of new new variants. There will be new variants. The Delta variant emerged around May, right? if you recall in um, in uh, um, when when was that in, in in India? And now the new variant has emerged. Uh, so there is clearly an indication that many more variants will emerge. All right, thank you. We have uh, received uh, two questions from Judith, so I'll give you one before coming on to the next one. So Judith is working with the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation in Nairobi. And she says, my question is, in the presentation, Dr. Nkenga Song said that there is need to embark on the booster jab for the vulnerable population in the face of the Omicron variant. But he also said, while answering to Girum Chala, that we need to ensure that more people are vaccinated before beginning to administer the booster jab. Could you kindly clarify on this issue of the booster jab? This is because we know that Africa has the highest number of immunocompromised people who might be in danger if they do not get the booster jab. So let, let me start with that. So first of all, let me address the immuno uh, uh, sub, uh, compromise population, which is mainly driven by the HIV. So my message to or everyone, uh, uh, all member states, and to those who uh, uh, have that immunocompromised status, is good, get out there and get your first dose. Go out there and get, for those who have received their first dose, schedule your second dose, and then ultimately get to your booster. The definition of booster here is that you're receiving a, a third dose after a full immunization cycle. So the point, Judith, is that you don't get to the third dose without going through the first and second dose, right? So I think that is the point I'm making, that um, for that population, we now know that, uh, that uh, what it can mean, especially in terms of uh, in, in, uh, in the face of the Omicron. So get out there quickly and get uh, start the immunization course. You, 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 there, there are not short courses to this. I think that you have to get your first dose, uh, prime your immune system, get your second dose, and subsequently get your third dose there. I think that's the point I'm, I'm making here. Yeah. And it is really a collective responsibility to do a campaign within our own sub-communities to immobilize people to go out and get their, their, uh, their, their first dose, just to start with. I mean, there are countries that, are, uh, if you look at the level of even the level of immunization with the first dose is still very, very low. So and yeah, you just don't get to the third dose without doing your first and second doses. All right. Uh, thank you, John. We cross over now to Larry Mado, who is with uh, CNN. And uh, Larry says, now that we have a month's worth of data since South Africa first detected the Omicron variant, 
what can you definitely say to the world about it? So I will still take a very cautionary uh, position, Madhu, that um, one, we are seeing, it seems like we are seeing less severity of the, uh, the Omicron virus uh, uh, amongst people infected in terms of, of a level of hospitalization in South Africa. The second caution I'm, make, I'm making here is that let's be careful not to extrapolate what we are seeing in South Africa across the continent or across the world. You just heard from a colleague from the UK telling us numbers in the UK in terms of severity or hospitalization. And I think if I recall well, uh, she put that at 40% and South Africa is at 80%. So we still have to see, uh, I mean, gather more data from countries that are, are, are seeing more of the Omicron variant before we can actually come out with a definitive position. But early indications are suggesting that the virus might uh, actually lead to milder infections compared to um, compared to the, the data. For one thing we are sure is that uh, the virus has a severe effect on a uh, vaccination program. That is for people that have received even the two doses of vaccines, they actually need to go, go ahead and get uh, the third sh uh, uh, shot in order to boost up the levels of uh, antibodies. I think those are the, two, the only two things we can say at this point. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, we say hello to Andrew Meldrum and he's with Associated Press. So Andrew says, what is needed to achieve mass vaccinations? Are African countries prepared to take vaccines to the people and also to have public education campaigns? And finally, does Africa need to consider vaccine mandates? So I think we, as I said earlier, we had a, a very successful meeting on Monday um, to address just that issue. And there are certain things that we must do and do all of them together. Increase the logistics for delivery from airport to arms. Increase a search capacity for workforce, that is the nurses, doctors that uh, can immunize. Make sure that vaccines come with the auxiliaries, the needles, the syringes that are required for vaccination. We also have to make sure that there's good logistics, transportation of, of vaccines from, the, from the, uh, the, the airports to the most uh, remote areas there. And we do that collectively. Again, that is why we had a meeting to address three things. One was, how, what do we do collectively in terms of strategies to bring out the population so that they can get the vaccines as they begin to arrive in a very steady manner? Second, how do we coordinate our efforts amongst partners? And thirdly, what kind of partnerships are required for them? The community has to be playing a leadership role in this. Community engagement, community ownership, and com community leadership are critical. We've seen this in our own efforts with the Saving Lives and Saving Livelihood Initiative that each time you involve and engage the community early in the planning, you have increased successes. Okay, we've seen that in Sierra Leone, in Sudan, and, and in Cameroon. So I think we really should learn some lessons from, from the vaccine mandates. My appeal to the population is let's not get there. Uh, by uh, Let's avoid mandates by just showing up and doing the right thing. Okay, the right thing is the social contract that I've called for the continent to engage at individual level and community level. Now, if a government of countries in Africa will invest to acquire vaccines and then uh, make it available to the population and uh, the population doesn't use the vaccines, then, then I think we are now pushing the countries to actually begin to consider more and more uh, the need for vaccine mandates. I think that for now, we still have that window opportunity to actually uh, go out there voluntarily and get vaccines. Vaccines are the most effective public health intervention that we know in the history of infectious diseases, period. It is thanks to these vaccines that all of us, most of us are alive today. I mean, a host, host of, we've received a whole spectrum of vaccines, including measles, polio, meningitis, a whole host of vaccines that have protected us. So I think I'll just leave that by saying that let's take our own personal responsibility and personal accountability to get ourselves vaccinated so that we protect ourselves, our loved ones, and our communities. All right, uh, thank you. James Chege has come back with another question, and I believe that James is with uh, Reuters. And he says, the Serum Institute of India 
the SII, has waived its protection from legal liabilities for any AstraZeneca Oxford COVID-19 shots that it supplies to a global program of refugees. The news comes days after Reuters reported that tens of millions of migrants may be denied COVID-19 vaccines from the vaccine sharing program COVAX because of concerns over who would be liable in the event of harmful side effects. Dr. Nkengasong, does this mean that AstraZeneca shots can reach some of the world's most needy people who would not be able to get inoculated through a national campaign? And also, what is your reaction to the Serum Institute initiative? I think all initiatives that enable and facilitate uh, us to vaccinate the vulnerable population is very, very welcome because this virus doesn't actually know that people are more vulnerable than others. They don't know the refugees population. We will not leave with this pandemic if we do not vaccinate everybody that requires vaccination. I think that is very, very, um, it's, it's very simple to, to, to understand that concept. So any efforts and any measures that are put in place or decisions and actions that are put in place to facilitate that will be highly welcome as, as contributing to the solution. All right, um, another question coming through from Judith Akolo with Kenya Broadcasting Corporation. And she says, is the delay in informing the public when a new variant let me just catch up with that because more messages have come in and um, moved things around a bit. All right. So Judith Akolo says, is the delay in informing the public when a new variant occurs helpful? While I know that science relies a lot on data, but when a new variant occurs and spreads fast, the public should be informed in good time so that they can take the necessary precautions. Yes, I think we should always, that should be the gold standard. The gold standard of uh, timely access to uh, the information um, so that we can collectively take actions. That is good public health practice. And I think, again, I would, we will never be uh, uh, thankful enough to the scientists in South Africa and the leadership of South Africa in the way that they handle the, the Omicron, uh, uh, the, the, the news around the Omicron variant. That was very, very encouraging. That should be the gold standard for, for everyone. Okay, thank you, John. Sarah Jerving has come back with a second mm -hmm. question. And she says, can you please describe the damage to the health systems as a result of the conflict in northern Ethiopia? What are your concerns for, for the populations that are living there? Well, the, each time you have a conflict, uh, Sarah, there's always a uh, 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 tremendous harm to the uh, health system that are already weak at any rate uh, in peace times, uh, health systems on the continent um, not where they should be. And in times of conflict, of course, you can expect that those systems will be further uh, handicapped. Um, we've always said that um, crisis uh, breed uh, uh, emergence of, of diseases and emergence of diseases breed crisis. So we are seeing the situation with the COVID-19, the kind of crisis that is breeding. And of course, the situation in any crisis region across uh, Africa would only uh, hamper efforts to control any uh, infectious disease, not just any infectious disease, but even dealing with the existing conditions in, <clears throat> in that excuse me, in that part of the world. So I think um, there's um, there's no doubt that conflicts will just make it difficult for us to achieve our uh, universal health coverage or sustainable development goals efforts. Okay, thank you very much. I'm receiving a request from Larry Mado, who says that um, um, your, your voice, I think, was breaking off at certain points. But Larry, please, if you want uh, to uh, pursue that further, please uh, do contact uh, Promise Kaniki, Dr. Promise, on this number, plus 251-904-139935. And he will be able to support you with your request. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions that are coming through on any of our platforms. 
just uh, taking a quick check. Yes, we do not have any more questions, nor do we have any more hands going up. So perhaps, uh, Dr. John, let me give you the opportunity to just uh, give your final um, comments on the issue today. But perhaps before you, you do that, we had a compliment from a gentleman called Ralph, and he was saying that he doesn't have any questions for us today, but he really just wanted to compliment the whole team for the excellent communications throughout the year. So thank you very much, Ralph, for that compliment. Dr. John, it's now over to you for your final comments. No, thank you. Let me start where, uh, uh, I, where I began the press briefing, that we are heading towards uh, the holiday season. Uh, we are in the middle of the holiday season, actually, today, the 23rd of December, and going up to the beginning of the year. Uh, we all uh, deserve to take time and spend with our families and loved ones. Uh, but please, let's do that with safety at the center. Uh, let's know, understand that we are moving, unfortunately, going to be celebrating uh, the end of the year holiday seasons in the middle of the food wave that is sweeping across the continent. And let's make sure that we do a couple of things that we've done for the last two years. We should not be complacent on safety measures. That is, uh, your, avoid mass gatherings up already. I mean, you offer the, the opportunity for the virus to spread, it will spread. And we have to be still very cautious that we don't know everything that we need to know about the Omicron and it's spreading across and truly uh, have to be sure that we uh, take extra measures by um, social distancing, washing our hands, face masking. All these measures have been known to be effective against um, the, the, any variant. So there will be no exception. Uh, uh, against uh, uh, the Omicron virus. There. So the Omicron virus, if we do the right thing, we can protect ourselves and protect our loved ones. I think that is a key message that I really like to ask the population to uh, look at public health measures. Second, vaccination. Uh, let's not talk about boosters, whereas we have not even crossed uh, the, a 10, we just barely crossed the 10 percentage line in terms of uh, those who have received their two doses there. So we still have to uh, be sure that we make, we commit ourselves to mobilizing our own sub-communities to go out there and get their vaccines, get their first dose, so that we can at least uh, be aiming at boosting after we've done the first and second dose. These are all measures that we need to do simultaneously to ensure that we protect ourselves and protect the continent against um, the emergence of the Omicron virus. Lastly, let me just say that it has been a pleasure for this year again working with all of you and i really sincerely thank you all for the uh, uh, the work the collaboration very very strong collaboration between uh, africa cdc the african union and the media in addressing and tackling this challenge it is the whole of society that will help us to eliminate this and uh, to win this war against the, the the COVID 19 pandemic and you have definitely played that role and we really be hoping for more as we, when we come back next year. As we, as I say, celebrate the end of year festivity, we count on the media to continue to be the, 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 the population's uh, teacher with respect to the facts. Let's spread facts and not fear with respect to the Omicron, with respect to the, the pandem uh, the, this pandemic overall. And again, you are the bearers of this information. You have the, the means and tools to transmit this information Again, let me leave you with this, facts, not fear. As we go to the holiday season, we know the facts. There's no need to, for us to, to panic with this, uh, the emergence of the Omicron. If we do the right things, we will be, we'll continue to protect ourselves. So I thank you so much. Enjoy your end of year holiday seasons with everyone, your loved ones, and of course, your, your friends and relatives. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. John Kengasong, Director of the Africa CDC. Um, but I'm sorry, um, we're receiving some late questions or rather questions that have come in um, after we had um, experienced that break. And uh, we have uh, Sophie Mukwena from SABC who has a question that she wants to ask live. Sophie, good morning. Please go ahead with your question. Good morning. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Nkenka, so next week, uh, China will be observing two years on the 31st of December 
since they detected uh, the coronavirus, it was on the 31st of December when everybody was in a festivity mood in 2019. Two years on, uh, much as, as a continent, we started detecting coronavirus much later, around March, if my memory serves me well. Two years on, what have we learned as a continent on pandemics, but also on capacity to deal with pandemics? And then the last question, how we are viewed globally? Sophie, that is a tough, those are tough questions, but let me address them as fully. And I think the, um, two years into the pandemic, we have seen uh, the, the power of political leadership. And uh, the, the first year of this pandemic was there with, with strictly public health measures. We had no, no uh, uh, medical countermeasures. The second year, uh, we, we, we witnessed the arrival of vaccines. And then the third year, next year, 2022, I would say will be a year that will require that we do three things, uh, testing, vaccine, and treatment. So the question about uh, the lessons for Africa, one, political leadership matters. The leadership of the AU, leadership of uh, Chairperson Musa Faki, leadership of uh, the, the chair of the African Union at that time, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, had been nothing short of being exceptional. And it stands to that kind of leadership that about 12 initiatives were uh, orchestrated on the continent. I've just named some. AVAT, the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team, the Trusted Travel, the Saving Lives, Saving Livelihoods Initiative, the African Union COVID Response Fund, the uh, African Medicine Supply Platform, and I can go on and on, the Pathogen Genomic Network that has enabled us all of us to be working as a network at the PAC initiative. I can really go on and on there. It is only because of such a coordinated action that um, the continent has been able to act as one. The second lesson uh, uh, is really what I call the power of regionalism. This is the first time, at least in my over 30 years career in public health that I've seen a region like Africa exercise uh, a strong coordination collaboration, collaboration, cooperation, and communication, the four Cs that we enacted in our continental strategy. That clearly has been a, 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 a very decisive uh, element in ability to fight this pandemic. We have supplied diagnostics across the continent, all 55 member states. Vaccines are being shipped across with a central coordination with this initiative, the ABAT initiative and a sector, so that is very, very important. The third thing is the important lessons that the continent has learned from other pandemics. South Africa, for example, if you look at the massive testing exercise that took place in South Africa early on, it was truly driven by community healthcare workers. I think that is an, 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 an area of interest that we need to share with the rest of the world. The important role of the original body like Africa CDC needs to be highlighted. Okay, now we now know that there are countries, uh, the Gulf states are interested in establishing their CDC. Asian states are interested in establishing their own public health agency. Just last week, I was on the uh, call with the, uh, the, the leadership of uh, Jordan, the country Jordan, they want to establish because they've all been inspired by what a, a regional body like Africa CDC can do. So I think that is clear, but there have been limitations. I mean, if we learn lessons, we learn the positive things, but the, the, uh, the, the not so positive things. One is our inability to produce vaccines. I mean, as I've said over and over, we import 99% of our vaccines and, in, and uh, manufacture only 1%. That situation needs to be changed. And you, we've created the African uh, the, uh, Partnership for African Vaccine Manufacturing, which is governizing and advocating for that. Diagnostics. We, as a continent, we're uh, uh, not producing any diagnostics at the start of this uh, pandemic. Now we know that South Africa, Senegal and Morocco are now producing COVID-related diagnostics, both PCR and antigen tests. I think that is very positive, okay, going forward. Let me just end by saying that uh, the, 
and I really hope that this would not be true, that the next pandemic, and I hope if there will be no next pandemic, the way we fight it on the continent will be very different from the way we fought this pandemic in Africa because of everything else that the platforms that have been put in place. Okay, if we uh, operationalize those platforms and then if we actually continue to move in the journey of vaccine manufacturing and diagnostics and pharmaceutical on the continent, we would have, we'd be preparing the continent better to fight this pandemic and subsequent pandemics. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, quick question from Rhoda Odiambo, who's with the BBC. And she says, does the Africa CDC have any information about Eritrea and whether it has begun rolling out COVID-19 vaccines? And this is in light of the fact that uh, countries are now rolling out boosters and yet no data has been shared on whether Eritrea has even started rolling out the first doses. Uh, not as far as we know uh, at this point, but we'll continue to engage and and if we have any updated information, we wish more than happy to share that with everyone. Okay, thank you very much. I think that definitely is our last question for today. So um, colleagues, thank you so much. As Dr. John has said, um, when he was uh, giving his final comments, uh, we want to thank you very much for engaging with us uh, throughout this year of 2021. And we wish you a very happy, uh, healthy, and a blessed holiday season coming up. So join us again in 2022, right at the beginning. Uh, but for now, enjoy your holidays. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that has definitely been our reliable resource on Africa's response to COVID-19. Uh, Dr. John Ngenga Song of Africa CDC saying, uh, rely on facts and not fear.